Good afternoon, everyone. I now call to order the meeting of the Building and Contracts Committee for Tuesday, March 5th, 2019. Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit could please come forward. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. You could please present the first item. Um, I also wanted to uh, indicate that we would like to withdraw item 13 if that hasn't happened yet, which is uh, KSH 322.17 for uh, painting at Honeygo Elementary. Is this work that has been completed already, or could you explain the reason for the withdrawal? Uh, the work uh, hasn't been completed, but it it will not necessitate a, a change order that has to come to the board, which is why we're withdrawing yeah, it. Right. Yeah. So the existing purchasing authority will cover the, the charges for the yes. work yes. to be done. Great. Thank you. So... Um, any questions, board members, regarding N13? Okay, hearing none. Okay, so the first item for this afternoon, ARA 20919, uh, Digital Library Resource, Open Educational Resources Content and Curation. Uh, this is a contract modification to provide for the continued access f uh, of the NetTracker online database and digital content software for all schools. This is a consent to the assignment of this contract from Novation Incorporated to ACT Incorporated due to uh, Novation's purchase by ACT Incorporated. And this was the only awardee on the contract approved by the board last October. Uh, no expenditures have yet occurred. Okay. The board originally approved this contract in October as of last year. I'm Correct. curious as to why there have been no expenditures incurred as of this point and well, we're the necessity of continuing this contract. We still have, uh, we're still using the balance of the subscription period from the prior contract and, and fiscal year. So um, we made this change uh, last year um, to, to move on to a new contract. We previously purchased this through the Maryland Library Consortium mm -hmm. and now we're purchasing it, purchasing it directly ourselves. Okay, so there actually is contract spend on the previous contract. Correct. We're using that subscription term. Do you know what those yeah. actuals are to date? Um, I Why don't do? think I have that information. It's about $100,000 annually. Um, and I don't have any other information, but I'd be happy to provide that to the superintendent. Okay, so we don't have overlapping subscription terms then since we're not incurring Jordan any cost okay. for this. Oh, okay. Mr. Umbriali has that information, I think. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Oh, here you go. Sure. Hi. It doesn't come out. I'll use this one. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Uh, the cost uh, in FY18, um, in 2018, FY2018, it was $101,000, a little over $101,000. But the cost for FY19 uh, is actually below $100,000. It's actually lower than that. It's ninety six, a little over $96,000. Okay. Great, thank you and, very much. And that bill we still have to pay. That's that's why we have not correct. incurred those to date. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Ms. Rowe? Can you briefly explain to me what NetTracker is? So it's an um, open educational resource curation tool. So essentially, you have open educational resources out there that are um, free for a number of reasons. Uh, their licensing has expired in terms of the ownership of that. 
Um, and so there's all these, they could be textbooks, they could be videos, uh, they could be individual objects that are available in some sort of digital form. And all of that material is out there to search or find. Oftentimes, um, when you just do, for instance, a Google search, you're going to get all sorts of advertisements that come with it, all of those kinds of things. What NetTracker does is it curates that, so they're educators on their end, uh, working with educators on our end, and that information is curated and then aligned to standards, so when students or teachers are searching for that information, it's presenting itself in a way that makes sense to a teacher or a student to use, and it doesn't come with all the ads or the wraparounds. NetTracker also has some added features, uh, so it can translate into Spanish, um, it has text-to-speech functionality, um, and you can change the Lexile level as well for text-based materials. So students have access to this as well as teachers? Yes, all students. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions, board members? No? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Imbriali. Okay, uh, next okay. item, JMI 61519, American Government Textbook and Civic Action Materials. This is a new contract for an American Government textbook with digital resources for high school students and teachers. Approval is requested for a seven-year contract with one recommended vendor and contract spending authority of $787,924. Okay, good afternoon. Ms. Shea? Good afternoon. Um, the question I have on this is, this purchasing authority includes professional learning for teachers to introduce the new materials. Can you describe what that consists of and if that's material, if it's materials or if it's in-person coaching or what, what does that So entail? both, both. So um, we will be providing training in the spring, mm -hmm. pending approval, of course, of the contract. And so there will be in-person training face-to-face -face with representatives from the vendor as well as members from my Office of Social Studies. And then that will um, be offered throughout the spring. We'll offer multiple opportunities for in-person um, as well as resources to support that. And then that will be repeated in August as part of Professional Study Day for any new hires um, that may come on board in between. And as a service, um, I know that this contract was not competitively bid because it pertains to curriculum, which yes. is allowed. But as a service to deliver professional learning for teachers, my question is, is that also um, allowed to be purchased without a competitive bid process? Or should the two be separate? And I don't think the, the board, since I've been on, has seen the, ser the professional development bundled this way with the purchase of materials. So asking for my own. So I would say in my experience, which is somewhat limited, they come together. So when we purchase a new textbook, it comes typically with, and sometimes there's a cost um, spelled out and sometimes it's just inclusive, but it actually is pretty typical that the professional development is part of the vendor's offering of how they're going to help us roll out or implement a new textbook or source in that way. So it's not separated. And do we have the breakdown of those expenditures? So in this particular one, it's included. In some of our next ones, I can itemize that for you. But in this particular one, it was just included as part of the free um, free materials with the purchase of the text. Was it, but was it priced? So it was not priced separately? It was not priced separately. In that proposal. Right. Each time uh, the vendor will give us a quote that may include a, a breakout or just may indicate that it, they like to say it's free, but it's really included in the price of the materials. So when they do that, so we don't request that itemized breakout when they bundle it? They, no, they will quote according to their, their own sales uh, standards. Okay, I would like to see that breakout for future approvals that come to the committee. To understand exactly what it is we're we're purchasing and what those itemized items are. Board members, other questions? Ms. Rowe? Can you tell me if this curriculum has been through the board curriculum committee? Yes, so um, this is an American government textbook. So we had standards that were changed. Um, so this entire presentation was a part of the last curriculum committee meeting in terms of the updates as part of this um, contract. Um, but in addition, last spring, we had a conversation regarding um, some of the new standards and so when we were describing to the curriculum committee our summer curriculum. 
some of the work that we would be doing. So this um, particular contract is for a core text to go with our Baltimore County created curriculum aligned government standards and the American government assessment. I think it's important um, for the board members to understand as well that textbooks aren't curriculum. That I do, but I have some mic issues. The textbook isn't curriculum. Um, the textbook is a resource to support curriculum. So when we talk about curriculum, we're looking at the framework, we're looking at the, the whole package, scope and sequence, you know, looking at the content, um, the timeline for implementation. That all kind of uh, constitutes curriculum, the standards, the alignment to standards, and then you have resources to support the curriculum. In this case, this is a resource to support the curriculum. I think just what my question was getting to is I just want to make sure that before we approve a contract that that this is already approved by the curriculum committee. So this looks like instructional materials to support curriculum, but the curriculum changes it sounds like have already been through the curriculum committee. Yes. So all the contracts today were also a part of our last curriculum committee meeting, and we talked specifically about the instructional shifts as part of that presentation. But in addition, some of the changes we made to the curriculum were a part of the presentation we made last year about our upcoming summer curriculum workshops. Other questions, board members? No? Okay, next item. Uh, next item is JBO 71119, topic specific supplemental resources for middle school social studies. This is a new contract to provide supplemental social studies instructional materials for grades six through eight students and professional development for teachers. Approval is requested for a six year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $471,330. And this contract also includes professional development. So, Michelle, you know the question I'm. Yes, and ask. this one was actually priced out. <laughs> I told you one was coming. So, the full day PD is um, $2,520 of this. Thank you. Yep. Board members, other questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Next item. Okay, uh, next item, JMI 61619. Topic specific supplemental resources for high school social studies grades 9 through 12. This is a new contract for topic specific social studies supplemental resource to support grades 9 through 12 students and teachers. Approval is requested for a five year contract with one recommended vendor and contract spending authority of $353,950. And Ms. Shea, do you know the breakdown for PD? I do. One day of PD um, is $3,150. Thank you. You're welcome. Board members, other questions? Hearing none, next item. Okay, next item, MBU 51519, Leveled and Independent Reading Collections. This is a new competitively bid contract for a variety of level texts aligned to standard reading inventories, including grade, Lexile, and guided uh, reading level using the Fountas and Pinnell leveling system for the BCPS offices language arts, pre K to 12, science, pre K to 12, social studies, Title I and schools. Approval is requested for an eight-year contract with 15 awardees and contract spending authority of six million dollars. Yes, Mr. McMillian. I sit on the curriculum committee, which most of you are aware, um, and this particular contract came out of the curriculum committee. Today, as I was leaving my house, I got an email that questioned the whole guided reading piece of this. Mm -hmm. So I want to make a motion, or, or however, to send this back to the curriculum committee. Is that, how do we handle that? Second. Well, let's see, how do we handle it? For a, re for a recommendation. So this committee can choose to take that as an action. So there's a motion on the floor and a second. Okay, so I recommend that this particular contract be sent back to the curriculum committee. For a recommendation? Or for further consideration? Okay, I started out with recommendation, but okay. you want that to be a motion? Yes, please. Okay, so I make motion. a motion 
that this particular contract, that I recommend that this particular contract be sent back to the Curriculum Committee for further review. Second. So that staff will have guidance on what that really means. So again, we're exploring um, what piece of it exactly? The guided reading piece, maybe that's something we can answer now. I'm just trying to ascertain what the Well, I think, it's, be, I think it's beyond me. I think the committee needs, the curriculum committee needs to review that in a little bit more detail than, mm -hmm. you know, not that they didn't do an outstanding job, but some information has come to us about questioning, you know, this particular way to do it. So I just wonder if I might answer the question mm -hmm. rather than going back. Because, uh, so if I may, this particular contract is just to buy books. This is to buy classroom libraries for kids to read for independent choice. It's to allow the science office to purchase books that align to a curriculum using Title IV grant funds. It's to allow um, schools to purchase classroom libraries. My guess is, and I, and I don't know, there are some folks who have concerns about guided reading, capital G, capital R, as an approach to reading. This particular contract is to buy books, plain and simple. This is to allow my office offices to have a contract to buy different titles for a variety of purposes. Specifically, the timeliness right now is because as part of our Striving Readers Grant, we have funds earmarked for the purchase of texts, and we also have, as part of Title IV grants, um, funds earmarked to purchase texts to support um, transdisciplinary um, instruction in integrating science and social studies in ELA. So my question is if the, the concern raises about guided reading capital G, capital R, um, which is an approach to reading that I know there is some consternation around as it relates to structured literacy, for example, and I just wanted to clarify that this is little g, little r, in terms of guiding readers as one option for the use of text. I, you know, quite honestly, I don't know enough about this and I would feel a whole lot more comfortable if it went back to the committee and the committee review this and dissect it in a, in a much deeper detail than I've done. And then if it, pass, if it makes it through the curriculum, then we send it back here. Is that okay? Yes, and the concern that I'm also hearing from the committee is has to do with the opportunity cost of making this investment over investing in the open court program as currently being piloted. Wait. If I, I think that we're if I may um, finish, I please, Ms. White, I have mixing the floor. apples and oranges. I'm not Go finished right complete answering my question. So I believe, Ms. Shea, what you're saying is the two are mutually exclusive, and the concern is um, the request of six million for uh, purchasing authority. Does that jeopardize um, the purchase of materials for open court in terms of opportunity costs? Should we approve this? So may I answer that question yes, explicitly? It is not an option for me to use the Striving Readers Grant funds that are earmarked in this case to purchase open court. Because as part of my application for the Striving Readers Grant, I had to identify in our literacy plan how these funds would be used. This is not spending $6 million. This is saying of our 175 school centers and programs, we spend a lot of money on books, as we should, in flooding our classrooms. So um, this, again, I believe that there are some that might be afraid that this is guided reading with a capital G and an R as an approach to teaching reading that is different than structured literacy. In Baltimore County, we absolutely support structured literacy, phonemic awareness, and phonics instruction explicitly, which is what the request for open court is about. This is not in um, contrast to that by any means. This is about flooding classrooms with books for kids to read, sometimes just for independent choice, and sometimes to supplement comprehension or integrated curriculum. So okay. in direct answer, the funds that I want to use immediately could not be used instead. So in terms of opportunity cost, doing that would not prevent that they're, they're two separate requests. So thank you for that clarification sure. because that is the concern sure. that funding will be available to expand open court should that be the direction that the system chooses to move in. So so th the existence of funds to support that I'm trying to figure is out independent when I can speak. of Ms. White. Thank you. Um, so I also just want to make sure that the board understands that there is a time frame for, for everything that comes through. Again, this is for the purchase of books. 
This is for the purchase of books. And so um, it's not that it can't go back to the curriculum committee, most certainly it can. When it goes back to the curriculum committee, however, you're talking about uh, another time frame out. You're also talking about purchase orders that have to meet a certain deadline in order to get done. And then the delivery of materials to schools. When we talk about flooding schools with resources, certainly we don't want to flood schools with resources without adequate time for them to process those resources, check them in. Uh, all I'm saying is that there is a domino effect to continuing to push things kind of um, back and forth. So these, these are not necessarily uh, the whole open court uh, solution, but this is for the purchase of books across the content areas. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ms. not, Ms. Oh, sorry. Ms. Rowe and then Mr. McMillian. So I think um, what I see is that you have this contract for books and materials and the way the contract reads, and then later on we have a contract for um, instructional or professional development. The cost of this um, and the cost of the professional development does tend to lead one to believe that this is a little bit more than just purchasing books. And so I guess my concern is that as a contracts committee, we're looking at procurement policies and costs. And if we're going to get into a conversation about the merits of it as it pertains to curriculum, that is the purview of the curriculum committee. So if Rod is unsatisfied that this needs to go back to curriculum, then I, I think that he's in the best position to know that. So may I ask a question just as a point of clarification? Um, we did do a presentation at curriculum committee, so this is not an effort to circumvent because I, I appreciate and agree that that's the purpose of us making that presentation. I, I was just trying to clarify, and again, the difference between spending authority and what may or may not be spent over the duration of We've been trying to do a better job of engaging in somewhat of the forecasting around how schools may engage with this. Um, there, this is not a lump sum. This is not a one time. But as part of our Striving Readers grant, and I know I'm jumping ahead to the other contract, um, when we sought input from classroom teachers and elementary school principals, because a portion of the literacy grant asked us, we had to spend 40% of that grant funds on elementary school. The maximum amount that we could apply total that in the state was up to $3 million. Taking only 40% of that did not allow for an option to use those funds for open court, because the cost of doing that would have exceeded that. So that's why I'm saying these funds are earmarked for a different purpose. We need both. I, I'm, I'm absolutely in support and, and passionate about the need for structured literacy. But what we heard from a lot of schools is that they needed support for their teachers about how to pull it all together. Teaching children how to read, especially in communities as diverse as ours, is very difficult. It really is rocket science. And our teachers have been given a lot of different resources, a lot of different approaches, and they need support with pulling it together. So the other contract is about providing job embedded professional development at a hundred and what are we up to now? Eight, seven <laughs> elementary schools. Yeah, yeah. And so it's about supporting teachers in pulling all that together to understand how to serve different needs of different students. This particular contract is just to allow spending authority. We may or may not, in the life of this contract, spend that much. What we were trying to say is we know we have funds from Title IV, we know we have funds from the Striving Readers Grant, and we know that schools spend their funds, both in operating and Title I funds, every year providing classroom libraries. And so we were trying to pull that all together in a contract so that we could have a contract to allow us to track spending and have that best pricing. Mr. McMillian. I'm very sorry, but I'm going to stay with my recommendation, send that back. However, I would like you to expand on the, on the timeline so that I have, is, is, is this a month we're losing? So or, I'm not I'm sure about that. I'd have to defer to Dr. McComas about the agenda. I guess the next curriculum committee meeting is in April. Um, Right, and then we would have to come back here, right? So while Dr. McComas is uh, pulling up the date, um, just a, a, a couple of things. So we'll, we'll take it back. I'm just trying to understand the, the process here. I, I believe in the past what we've done is to have it, um, you would have it go to the full board without the, the 
building contracts recommendation. Correct, Andy? Well, we go to the full correct. board with the recommendation. From that it would go back, right. Back but it would still go to the full board tonight. Yes. Uh, so for timeline clarification, our next curriculum committee is Thursday, March 21st uh, as scheduled. And then the earliest board contracts meeting, I believe, after that would be April 2nd. So it's essentially a month. Um, I would like to offer up, we certainly are already prepared to do a presentation on f open court and phonics. And part of that, we were discussing explaining our framework for literacy because these are books to support comprehension and fluency. Um, uh, there's very uh, multiple aspects to literacy development, and this addresses one component that is different than phonics itself. So uh, Ms. Shea is certainly more of an expert uh, in terms of teaching reading. Um, but I just offer up that our methods to teaching is part of a larger framework. And these are print materials to provide students the opportunity to read at their level. So when we talk about leveled books, we're talking about books that address where a student is as a reader so that they can build their capacity and reach the next level of um, complexity in their text. So at that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Shea, if you could um, reiterate, please, the breakdown of sure. the contract spending authority in terms of funding source, operating budget versus grant. You mentioned $3 million, and I want to make sure I understood that correctly. The $3 million um, I'm sorry. I was saying grant. that in the Striving Readers grant, okay. the maximum amount any LEA could apply for was $3 million. Um, I'm trying to explain why I didn't just um, apply for the Striving Readers grant to buy open court. Um, that was that explanation. In terms of this breakdown, um, that's not what I was referencing. Um, I, I don't actually have a breakdown of how that $6 million over the life because we're trying to allow for schools to spend it using their funds, and I don't know what that would be. Yeah, could I just Please. add that um, schools have a 15 rounded million dollar budget a year. So over this eight year term, that would be about $120 million that they spend primarily on instructional materials and supplies. So. This number was um, developed with that $120 million amount over this eight-year term to anticipate what schools um, uh, might buy with their operating budget as well as, you know, the uh, $25 million a year Title I budget, et cetera. And what I'm trying to understand is what portion of the $6 million requested spending authority has been earmarked for this versus open court. And for this, to understand that the schools, how can they um, use their own discretion in terms of what they want to purchase for their students? Can you repeat that last part? Because there was noise out there. I'm not sure I understood your question. I'm trying to understand which portion of the spending authority has been earmarked for this exclusively and if that's grant funding that's restricted to. And when purchase. you say this exclusively, I don't know. The entirety of this spending authority is for books. The entirety of this spending authority is for books. So when you visit classrooms and you see books on the shelf that kids pick and read on their own, or you see a teacher at a small group with a basket of books, that's what we're talking about here. And so if, if in it's terms because of- because it's being requested for this, but what I want to understand is of the funding source, and some of these are grant funds. Sure. Are those grant funds restricted to be used for these books? So as part of my application, our BCPS application for this Driving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant, we have been awarded for elementary school, which was a combination of books plus coaching for teachers about how to plan reading. Um, it was, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but approximately between five and 600,000 of the 1.7 million we were one grant. However, we also have Title I funding. So for example, the Title I office as part of their extended learning opportunity they offer in summer often uses funds to purchase books. Um, Title IV, and under the Title IV grant, we've been given specific amounts of money. I don't have that number, but we've been given money right now to support um, specifically integrating science, social studies, and ELA in elementary school. So um, that was part of our initial calculation of spending. And then 
as I work with schools, every year principals contact me asking me for resources where. So most recently, when we were opening Honeygo Elementary School, Principal Charlene Banky had contacted me about wanting to buy leveled libraries for her classroom teachers and to have a beautiful one, which some of you may have seen on your tour, for that school. So that would come as part of different funding sources. So in terms of the six million, I, I can't break down that six million. It was our best effort at coordinating across several offices as well as engaging with schools about how they may spend both grant and operating funds moving forward. Thank you. Sure. And I think um, it's helpful. Just the concern you're hearing from us has to do with community feedback. The community understands the opportunity cost of this investment. They, they do see the spending authority as six million I understand that that's not actual expenditures, sure. but it is an authority, and there is the opportunity cost of being able to invest that in others. I don't disagree that we need both, sure. but again, trying to make sure that we're using our dollars as wisely as possible, and the eight-year duration of that commitment when we're piloting other programs that may need other materials to support them, such as Open Court for Phonics, that that's what's being weighed by our community, why we're hearing concern right. over that. Because they know that there's not enough funds to go around, right? right. So um, I, there is a motion on the floor for this committee to make the recommendation. May I add one more point of clarification, just based on what you just said? I just want to make clear for all the community watching, it is not an option for me to use any of the funding sources I just identified to purchase open court. That, that would not have been an option based on the limitations I had with the grant application and how much money and how many kids we have. So doing this would not, I do hope that we are able to secure funds, but I want to be really clear, I cannot use Title I funds to purchase open court. I cannot use Title IV funds to purchase open court, and I cannot use the Striving Readers Grant funds that I have right now for that purpose. So I just want to make that part clear too, as the community is understanding that impact. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Rowe? So I heard you say something, um, and it makes me wonder, is this another thing like the gym clothes contract? I mean, is this yes. the kids? I see where you're going. The yes. Schools, <laughs> yes. The schools are picking out all the books. Yes. Or is this something the school system is purchasing for? It, so it would be both. It's OK. But yes, you know what I have, mean by yes, that, right? The I gym do know exactly contract, what you mean. How yes. we couldn't figure that one out. <laughs> yes, yes. So this is another one of those situations where we have a contract authority, spending authority, because every school is purchasing things on their own. Exactly. And now we have grant money, and we're pulling this into a contract so that those books that are broke down into my daughter has letters. They're by Lexile number or something. This is what you're talking about. The different. Yes, that's exactly what we're talking about. Okay. Well. I'm going to support Rod in any case because I don't feel like it's a big deal if the full board makes this decision, but I have, feel I understand more what you're going for. Thank you. Okay, so there is a motion on the floor that the committee recommends um, to the full board that we delay recommendation on this contract and instead ask for a recommendation by the curriculum committee. All in favor? Okay, that motion carries. Thank you. Okay, uh, next item seven, KSH 31319, cosmetology equipment and supplies. This is a new competitively bid contract for the purchase of cosmetology equipment and supplies for BCPS cosmetology careers programs for the Office of Career and Technology Education and Fine Arts. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $250,000 over the five-year term. Okay. Board members, questions? No? Okay, next item. Next item, KSH 31419, on-site professional development for guided reading coaching. This is a new competitively bid contract to provide professional development for small group reading coaching, <coughs> excuse me, for the Office of English Language Arts Pre-K to 12 and the Division of Organizational Effectiveness. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority $1.2 million over the five-year term. Okay, Ms. Rowe? So is this guiding reading small G or big G? 
So, and, and thank you for asking that question. It can be both. So um, I did actually want to adjust that language because of the capitalization, but because that's the way it was put on the RFP, I couldn't. Um, there is an opportunity in schools in addition to structured literacy where teachers meet with guided reading um, groups, but they also meet with lots of small groups for lots of different purposes. This is the contract that I referenced before as part of our Streaming Reading Readers Grant, the elementary reading specialist and a lot of the teachers and administrators that we sought input from shared that they really needed support with what they called putting it all together. So um, for example, we've done a lot of work in the last several years around identifying assessment tools, um, screener tools to help diagnose students who have different areas of weakness in reading. We've done a lot of work to support teachers with planning to be responsive to that data. This is a contract for job embedded coaching. So the model that we outlined in our grant application was that every element would identify a literacy leader to be trained as a coach to go into classrooms and support a first grade teacher with, let me help you look at all your data and plan for all of the different groups of students that you're working with. Some of the work will be in phonics groups. Some of it will be in guided reading, capital G, capital R. Um, and some of it will just be in small group, te um, complex text groups. So helping students who may need additional support access grade level text. So this is about providing the training. So so as I mentioned before, the plan that was outlined in the grant application was that every elementary school would be able to identify a literacy leader to participate in ongoing coaching training delivered by this award vendor. Okay. Other questions? Hearing none, next item. Next item is uh, LKO 42219, football and lacrosse equipment reconditioning. This is a new cooperative contract for football and lacrosse equipment reconditioning for the Office of Athletics. Approval is requested for a two-year, five-month contract with the option for two years extension with two recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $180,000. And in this case, the $180,000 is the spending authority for the initial two-year, five-month term. Uh, we would, if we chose to exercise the extension, we'd come back to the board for additional spending authority. Okay. Questions? Mr. McMillian. Dr. Adams, I was just, did we figure out how long lacrosse has been connected with the football piece? We did. It's been a number of years, Mr. McMillian. Um, I spoke with Mike Sy, and he um, said that when we initially started that um, it may have been possible that everyone didn't know, and so some schools may have been paying for the reconditioning for lacrosse on their own, but we've had a contract like this in place for several years. Wow. Uh, so does that... You know, I did that job for 25 years, and I didn't know, you know, whether it was the last five or 10 years, that we could send our, uh, our lacrosse helmets out every spring or every, you know, at the conclusion of the season, send them out for conditioning. I was part of that every year for football. I was very aware of that. But I did not know that we could do that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? I just have to know. Is this safe to recondition versus buying new because these are kids' heads? Yes, <laughs> appreciate that question. So um, one, a football helmet has a lifespan of 10 years regardless of whether it could still be reconditioned. Um, reconditioning does bring the football helmet back up to safety specifications. If a helmet cannot be brought back to space, se safety specifications, it is not returned to the school. So for example, if I were an athletic director at Newtown High, I might send my 75 helmets back after the season, only 62 of them may come back reconditioned because the other um, others were not able to be reconditioned and then we have to purchase new ones. So does this vendor who's doing this have some sort of certification for this process? Is there some Yes, it's what they standard? do, it's what they okay. do, yes ma'am. Mr. McMillian. Just to add, they'll actually send the rejects back too. So you get both of them. So if you send your 75 out and you get your 62 ones, the helmets that have been reconditioned, they'll give you the other 13 in a box with rejects on it so that you know, you know, it justifies what you sent out. I misunderstood my apologies. No, 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 no I'm not, I was just adding that. I appreciate it. You know, to let you know that you do see the rejects. Well, that's good. Then you know what a reject looks like before the season's over. Okay. Other questions? 
Thank you, Dr. Adams. Next item. Okay, uh, LKO 419, electronic health record software for pre-K through 12. This is a new competitively bid contract for an electronic health record software system for health ser services. Approval is, is requested for a five-year contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $1,239,000 over the five-year term. Okay. Am I correct in understanding that this is to replace the current system? Yes. Due to accessibility requirements. Correct. Is that correct? And that the current system, I believe, was approved by the board two years ago? Do you, I don't know the original approval date uh, for it. was approved in spring of 2017. So, all, yes, just almost two years ago. And at that point, were we screening software for selection based on accessibility requirements? Yes. And uh, the vendor, George. yeah. We were phasing in that process, and so the screening um, questionnaire was distributed to the vendor after the contract signing. And our current expenditures on that contract are $402,520? Yes, ma'am. Does the, the vendor have any plans to bring their product up to accessibility guidelines? The, the current product? Current product. The current product is called SNAP. And uh, no, they don't have a, they have a timeline that goes outside of our contract and it was very general and it did not meet our um, expectations. So the timeline to bring their product up to accessibility specifications was not specific? It was very general, it was unrealistic, and it was outside of the timing of our contract. So what would our expenditures be if we were to remain on the current product. I'm trying to understand the additional expense because we are going now to a different product, abandoning one that we have currently spent over 400,000 on, and it is not, it does not meet accessibility requirements. So what additional expense is being incurred because the current product does not meet those requirements now? The easiest way for me to explain that is that it's a, it, what the additional expense is a site license. So what we're buying is a license to use the product. And if under SNAP, the f full product, had we been able to roll out the full product, would cost $241,000 a year. We did not spend that because we could not f roll out the full product. Does that make sense? So we spent less, we negotiated down on the expenses as we, tr as we tried to resolve the issues with the vendor. So we paid, I want to say 175,000 this year, but it I would have to double check my, my numbers this year of what was paid to the vendor. So the information we received said that the annual expenditures on the prior contract were 201,000. That's and very the total contract expenditures are 402,000. That sounds So right. I'm trying to understand what it is we purchased or have spent 400,000 on to date and are now being requested to approve an additional 1.2 million on a different system. It sounds like we're abandoning one that was partially implemented? Is that, so we, am I understanding that correctly? Yes, we partially Im implemented it and we're shifting. I, I consider it a transition as opposed to abandonment. So what we did over the past two years is we digitized all student immunization data. They all turned from paper forms into the computer. As part of this new contract, the digitized Immunization data turns into the new software. So the nurses, when they open it up, the students' immunization data will be there and we will hit the ground running with that component. The nurses have also, over the past two years, learned to use software in their practice, in small parts of their practice, the parts that we were able to kind of integrate. So I do see it as the next phase, but we are limited. If we stay with the current product, we will have to use a, a limited rollout because of the accessibility issues. We will not be able to use it with parents, we will not be able to use it with teachers, and we will not be able to use it for visits because the, the screens are not accessible. So of the expenditures to date on the former contract, it sounds like a large percentage of that was probably used for the digitization of those immunization records. Is that an yes, accurate statement? The vast majority in year one, and that was 100%. That, that data will be migrated to the new system? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. 
Um, however, we will need to retrain or new training will be required for those users of the system and that the plans are to make um, this system available to parents as well as teachers, which that was not the plan with the with SNAP or the current system. Yes. This, this system has a much fuller rollout option because it, ha it includes the option for single sign-on. Um, the old system did not allow our parents to have single sign-on, so there was no practical way for us to make the program accessible to parents, plus they, it was, did not meet our accessibility requirements. So yes, we can use the new software, has a much broader um, use than the old software. Is there a reason this new product was not selected originally? I'm trying to understand the basis for making the switch because it, it hasn't been that long since we approved the current system that's in place to want to understand the justification and why this was not the plan originally. It sounds like it has a lot of benefits. It does. Uh, the, the old software, so SNAP, the first thing is that um, SNAP, in the review process, SNAP came out as the most user-friendly process, and, and it is. The vendor um, claimed, to be honest, that it was fully accessible, and we understood the product and presented, the vendor presented the product to be um, a web-based, a, a different, different platform than it turned out to be. So there was some misrepresentation of the product that until we got into the product, we were not made fully aware of. And so there were multiple levels of problems, to be honest. So that product was not tested prior to the last contract being executed to understand that it was not the platform as represented? Well, I think because we went ahead and made the decision ourselves to go ahead and, and start using the product for the last two years, rather than uh, ending the project, we really um, did not have the uh, ability to uh, settle over these terms that were in dispute. So we elected to go ahead to digitize the records, implement a, a new system, um, and once we made that decision, it took a lot of options off the table. So in terms of the 400000 that's been spent, what would you say would be a sunk cost of that? For, so the portion not spent on digitization for use of a system we're not moving forward with, if you could approximate. Can you say that question one more time? Of the um, expenditures on the previous contract to date, $402,520, do you have the itemized breakdown of that in terms of digitization of immunization records versus sunk cost into a system that we're not moving forward with? No, I would not be able to give that breakdown. But basically, we paid, uh, the second year, we paid $186,000. We haven't paid any more than the regular license cost for the program. We've used the program for the period, and we're simply going to take those budgeted costs and spend them next year on a different program. So that's based on the, the annual um, licensing costs Correct. versus an initial upfront investment in the product itself or an Correct. outlay. And, yeah, and I don't recall seeing any breakout data on the implementation cost, but um, it might be something we could locate. Okay. Do you have an itemized breakout of the migration costs to move to this new application, or is that part of the uh, license? Yes, I do. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, over there, this thank you. And yes, that's this. what I was looking for. Okay. So yes, the um, oops. I think it's the. Oh well, wait. I had it open this. over here. Oh, there's this. Is that it? That's enough. Okay. So the um, the training costs to train our staff to become trainers is seven thousand five hundred dollars. The. Um, Access, um, there's an annual subscription to their online tutor, which is $12,500. Uh, the license fee for um, the users is um, $187,000. So the, the majority of the expenses are 
in, do you want me to give me the full breakdown? I mean, do you want me to add up to the one, 275 for year one? I'm trying to understand the question, so in I give you the case, right numbers. To understand the yeah. cost by migrating from the current system to the new system. The setup fee in this case is $25,000. $25, That's it, yeah. And how do the annual expenditures compare for the, against the SNAP current annual? They are very, very close within probably $20,000. Again, it's not com completely apples and oranges because of the different, the different components, the parent portal, et cetera, et cetera. But they're very close. Okay. I would say probably 220000 with the existing product and 240000 with the new product. Okay. And the, the new functionality would be the parent portal. You mentioned a few other um, enhancements. That right. There's the parent portal. It offers single sign-on. Teachers can access the system. Um, it it um, would be allow the nurses to use it fully for all of their practice as opposed to just for components of their practice. And how has this system been vetted as compared to the system we have in place now? There was a very detailed RFP process that occurred again this fall. We then um, put it through a sandbox environment. We put it through an extended sandbox environment because we wanted to be sure that we were moving to something that was significantly better. Um, and so that occurred through December. We then went to Prince George's County to meet with Prince George's County, who has used the software for three years, Dr. Nieves? Three years. For three years, and sat down and had a, a day-long meeting with their staff about what they liked and did not like about the software and their rollout plans. So would you say that greater due diligence was exercised with um, evaluating this product versus so, SNAP? I'm going to have to interrupt because there is um, litigation involved. And I'm happy to answer questions or have questions answered in closed session. Okay. Not sure what to make of that. Ms. Rao? So, can you um, explain to me who participated in the sandbox? Sure. And for the sake of people watching, tell them what a sandbox is. So a sandbox is um, access to the software. It's a virtual school. So it, the nurses would sign in and use it as if it was a virtual school. And our sandbox review committee involved a numerous staff from school-based staff, so our school nurses, health assistants went into the sandbox and raided the sandbox, my staff of um, su nursing supervisors were on that committee, as were staff from the Department of Inf DOIT, Department of Information Technology, looking at it from a technical lens. Did we evaluate the software based on various student privacy data? Because if you have parents accessing it and you have teachers accessing it, did someone try to hack it in the sandbox just to see if you Mr. could? Mr. Corns, can you come up and talk about the student data privacy piece, please? Uh, so, uh, Ms. Rowe, I don't believe that anyone tried to hack the software. What we have is um, both assurances uh, that the software is both HIPAA and FERPA compliant. The vendor has also agreed to sign our student data privacy requirements, and uh, they have been implemented in uh, uh, school systems uh, other than ours. So um, our, our normal practice is to uh, validate um, multiple uh, pieces of their practice. For example, do they encrypt data in transit and at rest? Uh, are their databases all stored within the continental United States? Uh, have they passed a SOC 3 audit uh, or participated in something of the like? And all of those have come back as a positive. So short, short of actually hacking the system, no, we didn't engage in that, but we did uh, what I feel do our due diligence to make sure that it's a safe and secure environment. So this is entirely, a, it, it's hosted outside the school system? Yep. Okay. Mr. Corns, it would be helpful and interesting to the board to receive that checklist that is used when doing your due diligence. Sure. Um, at the time when we are asked to approve such contracts. You uh, tend to get the same questions. So, again and so again, Ms. So may, may I ask, um, is that, um, uh, would you like the template? Yes, please. Sure. In that, addition to contracts moving forward, for instance, you answered my questions regarding the SOC 3 audit, and several of the, the items in your list were on mine as well, so sure. it would be helpful for the board to receive okay. that to see what due diligence is performed. Okay. Okay. Were members other questions? Hearing none, thank you.
Okay, uh, next item, MWE 84015, cases uh, for Hewlett Packard Revolve G2 computers. This is a contract modification to provide for the continued use of cases for student devices. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by $791,000, bringing the revised total contract spending authority to $1.891 million, with one awarded vendor approved by the board in May 2015. Thank you. Mr. Corns, what is the per case cost? We're at about eight, contract. We're at about eighteen dollars a bag. It's a little. It's a little less than that, but it rounds uh, pretty firmly to eighteen. Okay. And do we know these would be replacement cases? I imagine. One yeah. There. So the as as with uh, anything that comes in the direct contact with students, uh, eventually the bag will become uh, something that we want to dispose of and replace with a, a a more useful bag. So that's exactly what it's for. These are replacements. Okay. The, the bag itself has not changed in terms of what we're providing no. to students. There were some issues. I know that a, lot, a lot had to be replaced following last summer with storage. There were mold issues. There were issues with the cases themselves that schools had to replace those. So, so. We, these, these, uh, Ms. Hen, these have, um, we've had a variety of uh, reasons uh, the cases have been, uh, needed to be replaced. And um, we've had a, a pretty strong track record with the, the bags we have, regardless of the amount that may have shown up as a, I want to say a little bit of anomaly last year. But we have, um, we have a pretty strong belief that these cases are the ones that we need. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? So one of the things that I saw um, a while back ago, we had some feedback about the condition of cases. Mm -hmm. If we send our helmets out to be reconditioned and cleaned, can we send these cases out once a year to be cleaned and reconditioned, and will that save us some of the replacement costs, or is it just cheaper to replace it? So that, that's a great question, Ms. Rowe. We, we're actually exploring both avenues. What does it take to have an industrial clean done versus what does it take to uh, simply maintain um, a, a, long, a uh, replacement bag cycle uh, and, and kind of validating which one of those is the more cost-effective manner? Um, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of conversation internally about planning and, and deciding about how bags are issued to students at the beginning of the year based on the way that they were collected. So there is a lot of internal conversation around the bags. So, but uh, your point's well taken, and we are in, in the investigation process of, is it cheaper to, to throw them through an industrial washer? Because they are machine washable. Okay. Mr. McMillian? And did we get rid of a lot of bags at the end of last school year because uh, they, was it because they, last year's device didn't, the bag didn't fit this year's device? No. No, sir. Uh, the, the bag that we have fits uh, both the, the new, or the newer model and also the Revolve. Um, the, this contract has the Revolve reference because it was the way the contract was written back in 2015. But no, our current devices fit in these bags just fine. And what is the replacement bag schedule? Have we standardized on a set schedule um, for replacement? Uh, we, we are replacing the bags when the laptops come up for replacement. Uh, so it's, it's all new at one time. OK, okay other questions? Hearing none, thank you, Mr. Corns. Uh, next item, MWE 81914, Temporary Services. This uh, contract modification will provide for the continued use of temporary staffing services for the Office of Food and Nutrition Services. Approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by $75,000, bringing revised total contract spending authority to $415,000 with two awarded vendors approved by the board in August 2014. Questions? Next time. Ms. Rowe? What exactly um, does the staff do that this contract is for? There, there's two primary categories. One is clerical support, and one is material handlers uh, in the warehouse, and I believe drivers, temporary drivers and materials handlers. So I see something in here about um, data entry services for meal benefit application processing. 
Is that for processing the farms forms? I, it may be, I'll see if, uh, yeah. So do you know how much it costs us to process the farms forms? No, I don't. Thank you. Regarding that data entry, I have a similar question, and that is, has there been any effort toward moving to a digital um, form or online form for farms to replace the current paper farms form? Uh, I'll have to research that and provide the superintendent with a response. That I imagine would reduce the need for the data entry expense of that position to have yeah, a self-service form. Yeah, we're constantly looking for opportunities to digitize and automate. Okay, thank you. Other questions, board members? No? Okay. Next item, please. Uh, next item is ARA 21719, copy and printing devices. This is a new cooperative contract for leasing and maintenance of copiers and printers for the Office of Purchasing. Approval is requested for a three-year, seven-month, four-day contract with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $7 million over this three-year, seven-month term. And what are the current annual expenditures? The annual expenditures are approximately $6 million for the entire program. And you recall, this was a cost that was centralized and um, taken out of the school budgets so that we, uh, Office of Purchasing, assumed the responsibility for all the leases and all the maintenance and the supplies as well. So that's been a uh, very popular decision, I think, in the schoolhouse. Okay. So the rationale of the authority amount of seven million is based on the fact that we've um, recently replaced some of the equipment. Is that based on the projected need for yes replacements and yes. service? So, so we uh, so with with uh, this vendor, Daily Computers, we still have about uh, two hundred and sixty-five uh, printers copiers that we're leasing. And uh, the initial lease period uh, was a five-year lease, and uh, some have been replaced uh, in, uh, uh, at lower rates in 2016 and 2017. So we projected out uh, the expiration on the balance of those devices and the maintenance fees uh, to the conclusion of the leases. Board members, other questions? Ms. Rowe? Can you go over the procurement process for this contract and what went into your decision making for this vendor versus the other vendors that applied? Yes, so uh, both uh, contracts are cooperative agreements through national or uh, state cooperative agencies. Um, Last year, we did a competitive proposal uh, for the entire program to include um, management components and a 24-hour help desk um, and the ability to uh, sort of restrict schools and what they could copy and print. Um, and that we found that the pricing that we got was more expensive than just the lease and maintenance program that we had. And so we decided that to minimize costs, uh, the best option would be to stick with a maintenance and lease agreement. And so both of the current vendors uh, gave us a series of proposals and uh, we found that we uh, are gonna be saving um, several hundred thousand dollars a year with by just doing a maintenance uh, and lease program. So that's what we're recommending. So did not all the other vendors offer a maintenance and lease program? 
uh, both of the current vendors did offer. Yeah, we, we had six bids. Okay. We, we did not bring that forward to the board because it was, it was uh, not a cost savings. So, um, and at that time, the two current vendors gave us a series of <coughs> price reductions and uh, which they're entitled to do under the contract and we took the lowest price. Okay, so when we originally bid this, all of the vendors had the opportunity to bid on both scenarios? Yes. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Sure, that would be, as I said, uh, we've asked 13 to be withdrawn and uh, the next one is Mr. Dixit's, I believe. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, item 14, JMI 609-18 is for uh, providing consent to the assignment of this contract from Spears Wara uh, to Bella SVA. This is one of the consulting company for mechanical, electrical, plumbing that board had approved. It has been acquired by another company so we are just, uh, they changed the name of the company. If anything, it will give us uh, more staff, uh, access to more staff. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Ms. Rao? So I'm noticing a lot of these contracts are coming through with companies simply changing names or like having buyouts. Do we have any process to ensure that it's not a situation where the company had some sort of scandal or lawsuit or something, and then they're just changing names to escape what they now have a bad reputation. Do we have something in our procurements process yeah, we, that checks that? When we, uh, we check references as well as we check their uh, status um, with the state of Maryland and um, uh, any, any debarments or any uh, actions taken against that vendor by any entity. So that's part of our uh, due diligence process. So, so in our system, for instance, if a company were to have some situation that would make them ethically undesirable to work with, and then they just change their name, <clears throat> we would find that? I believe so, um, unless Ms. Webster wants to elaborate on the the variety of checks uh, that we take. <clears throat> good, morning, good afternoon. When a sorry, when a company changes name like that, we do go back and check all these documents that we've checked the first time we awarded to them. If a company is having trouble, um, whether it be financially or otherwise we're going to hear about it. Um, there's a, um, when you're working with a company and vendors are very quick to share information about other vendors with us. <laughs> so we will hear about it from angles other than those mis which Mr. Saris identified. Thank you. Thanks. Next item. 15 CWA 105-19 is for boiler replacement at Scotts Branch Elementary School. Uh, the boilers at Scotts Branch uh, have lived their useful life. They are more than 15 years old and we are going to re replace them uh, with efficient, energy efficient boilers. There are seven bidders and the lowest bidder has done work with us and the funds are provided under the capital plan that board had approved. Next item. Next contract is uh, CWA 10319 for uh, architectural consulting services for a specific purpose of design services for roof repair and replacement. Board in the past has approved a list of architects for general architecture work, including roof. Uh, the team decided that if we have architects that are specialized in roofing work, we have a chance to get better price and better skill level. So as part of that uh, concept, 
and, and consistent with policy 3250, selection of design and construction consultants. Um, we have, we are recommending list of these following architectural companies that have additional expertise in roof design. Questions? Hearing none? Next item. Okay. Next batch of um, contracts are for uh, replacement of Chadwick Elementary School, okay. uh, JBO 71219, package 6A for general trades, 7A for roofing, and 9A for flooring. Uh, as you'll recall, board had approved several different packages before in January 8th meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are the three additional packages. It'll be followed by one more package for steel work in your April 9th meeting. So we are requesting your approval. Okay. Questions, board members, on those? Okay. Item 20 through 24. MBU 51019 are for Colgate Elementary School, uh, and it is similar to Chadwick. Board has already approved packages in June 12th meeting and February 19th meeting. Uh, this, this group is for structural steel, 5A, 7A roofing, 9E painting, 11A food service equipment, 16A electrical, and that will leave us with one more package that will come to you in your May 7th meeting for drywall and acoustical work. Okay. Board members, questions? On call date. Okay. Thank you. Next item. Next item, 24, uh, 25, is JBO 71019, is for roof replacement at Orem's Elementary School. Uh, this is one of the projects that was included in the capital plan. Uh, we have three bidders, and the lowest bidder has, uh, has been recommended uh, by, the, by the purchasing department. It's a responsible, responsive and responsible bidder, and we are requesting board's approval for that. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Hearing none. Next item. The next contract, uh, 26, CWA 70219, is for video surveillance and card access control system uh, for the safety initiative at Kenwood High School and Franklin High School. If you'll recall, uh, these schools have just undergone uh, air conditioning, installation of central air conditioning, and we had left this work as the last part of the renovation of that school. So this is for the camera system. The camera system has been developed with the help of uh, Department of Safety and the principal. Questions? Okay, hearing none, that was our last item. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Thank you. Board members, do I have a motion to forward to the full board for approval items N1 through N4 and items N6 through N26, excluding N13, which was withdrawn. So moved. Second? Second? All in favor? Okay, that motion carries. It's 442, and we are adjourned. Thank, Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.